Hi, this is Nash from Alpha Phi, and today I'm going to answer a great question I got from a client who's looking at opening a policy to uh, basically understand, is my policy still gonna earn more than my interest payments? This person and, and myself included being an, an avid real estate and investor, so leveraging the policy cash value to reinvest in other places to essentially try and build wealth in two places at once. And I thought this was a great question because we're in such interesting times. We have rising interest rates like very dramatically. We have historically low dividends in the policy. So we wanted to look at, well, does it make sense to still arbitrage all the money and put it in uh, different investments? And are we still earning uh, you know, and leveraging the power of the policy as much as, as as it has been powerful in the past. So I put this together, hopefully make some sense of that, and I hope this is helpful. All right, so that basically the, the summary is, is my policy earning more than my interest payments? And the big uh, takeaway is it really depends, and I hate to give that answer, but there's basically ways that it can, and there's ways that it won't. Um, so, you know, uh, people use uh, this concept and this strategy of high cash value whole life to try and build wealth in two places at once, or people call it making money in two places at once. Uh, so, you know, just want to be very clear on what that means and how, and how you can and how it can hurt uh, wealth building. So, um, it used to be a much easier yes. The reason that it's not a definitive yes is that today's rising inflation and interest rates um, make it highly dependent, dependent on use of the policy. So we're going to take a little look at history because it's, you know, these interest rates, uh, the dramatic increase uh, and what effect that's having. And then finally, uh, how can we use these policies to continue to build wealth and not, not impact it? So first I wanted to talk about the history. So this is the history of kind of core CPI, uh, Moody's bonds, which a lot of these policies and dividends are tied to the Moody's AAA corporate bond index, and then dividends of, high, of uh, cash value uh, mutual companies. So uh, blue is CPI, and you see that a dramatic disconnect happens here is when they move to core CPI, removing energy and uh, food from the equation because those are too volatile. And uh, uh, so anyways, that's a whole different topic, but um, CPI kind of disconnects from that for a while. Uh, Moody's corporate bond index, and then the green being the dividend interest rates of uh, Guardian, in fact. So, uh, like I said, CPI kind of uh, disconnected from that because they moved to a different, you know, measure of how they uh, measure CPI. So, really, a good indication of more of a correlation to dividends is the Moody corporate bond index, and you'll see that Moody's has uh, generally trended ahead of uh, dividends by a year or two, and that makes sense because you know the insurance companies are uh, investing in safe assets. Um, not only has Moody's corporate bonds uh, kind of trended down over time for the past uh, couple decades, but also um, you know real estate cap rates and that sort of thing have also trended down over time. So. Uh, generally, that's that has come down, and and if you plot uh, Fed funds rate, it's also been coming down. Um, so you know, borrow, borrowing money has been cheaper as well. But key note, it offsets to dividends by a year or two, um, and also it's trended pretty pretty closely. So in this little blip, you have a little increase in dividends, a little dip, you know, here and there. Uh, and what has been happening? is that dividends have kind of flattened out and stayed constant. Uh, Moody's has been going down and that's shot up and CPI has shot up and the Fed funds rate, so effective interest rates, say like on 30 party lines of credit, has also shot up and we'll look at that next. Um, but since we see this Moody's uh, uptick here, we would expect based on history, that dividends would also start to over the next few years, mind you, this is a big, tanker ship, it's not a Ferrari or you know some sports car going to turn on a dime, but dividends likely to, uh, to trend up as well. 
So that's the first lesson we can take from history is that um, you know it doesn't really trend with CPI. However, it does trend with Moody's and the Fed corporate or Fed funds rate has also kind of followed this as well. So if Moody's corporate bond index is trending up, we may see dividends trend up in the next few years as well. Uh, so this is Fed funds versus CPI. And so Fed funds rate, we were looking uh, over the, over this time frame as well. Fed funds rate is in the uh, light blue. So it's been trending down over time as well. Actually hit zero, trended up, hit zero, trended up. So this is really what impacts the borrowing rate uh, on the ver either a variable component of high cash value whole life policies or uh, third party lines of credit. So back you know a few years ago, the borrowing rate on third party locks was 3%, 3.25%, uh, which are normally the floor rates. Uh, banks want to make some spread. So even though the Fed's funds rate is zero, those borrowing rates may be three, three and a, half, three and a, a quarter percent. But recently, uh, it has been ticking up, um, and this is to help uh, try and slow the economy down. But you'll notice that that um, this kind of correlates with things getting out of control, say like the dot-com boom, they increased rates and then had to slow down dramatically because the gray bars here are recessions. Um, and each time you get a recession, you know, they have to uh, kind of increase the liquidity knob, have people take out credit and re-stimulate the economy. Uh, 2008, same thing, they started hiking, hiking broke something. You know, this is the 2008 recession and they went to zero very quickly. Uh, 2020 was was a very rapid, you know, different uh, different because it was COVID and a pandemic. They didn't really know what to do, but they they crashed rates. People, you know, the economy has gone crazy. Uh, I expect it's not showing up here yet, but we're headed or maybe in another recession. Who knows? But uh, and they're kind of anticipating that as well and hiking hiking rates. So trying to slow things down because CPI is getting out of control. But one thing's clear here is that the Fed funds rate in, and this is true for all uh, MMT, modern monetary uh, theory economies, meaning like, uh, you know, where the, the Fed uh, controls the supply of money, all of these types of economies have the Fed funds rate or interest rates have trended towards zero. And even though you get a uptick every once in a while, they try and slow things down, it all trends to zero. So uh, let's look at a few others. Europe, Europe and Japan are a little ahead of the US, right? So um, in terms of trending towards zero, they've been at zero for a long time. Europe has recently begun to hike, hike rates to slow things down, but um, have basically been at zero and, and perhaps negative in some areas, say Switzerland, for a long time. Japan, even longer, has been at zero and they're not hiking at all and they're printing or, or making lots of money um, all the time. So in MMT economies, which the US is uh, modern monetary theory economy, interest rates do tr tr tend to go to zero over time even if there's little blips. So uh, looking at some of the history, dividends have traditionally followed bond yields, which are increasing today. And this would indicate a prediction of increasing dividends over the coming years based on the history. Also, the Fed funds rate has trended towards zero over time in MMT economies, Europe and Japan being ahead of the US, but even the US was at zero for a while. Um, until things with CPI got out of control and they had to start hiking to slow things down. But once things come crashing down, which things are probably gonna start breaking if they haven't already, uh, they're gonna have to reduce rates, start printing again. Um, so uh, that this just indicates based on history, dividends may be ticking up, maybe not for long because bonds may come back down with the economy slowing and all of that going on. Uh, and the interest rates likely headed towards zero. So third party lines of credit uh, based on those spreads headed back down to, you know, the three, three and a quarter, you know, percent over the next couple of years. A uh, lot of predictions in there and I apologize, but this is what I truly feel uh, may be happening over, over the next uh, couple years, five years. So what do we do right now? 
Based on these policies, how do we ensure the use of the policies to build wealth in these interesting times? Because um, let me take a, a quick sidestep here. Looking at this uh, policy, basically 100,000 for 10 years. This is a 53-year-old female client. Um, you know, growth looks looks quite nice, but this is a growth scenario, not taking any any loans against the cash value, um, and so you know we hit uh, break even between years five and six. Uh, five hundred thousand has gone in in five years, meaning four hundred ninety six in cash value, and in year six, six hundred's gone in, six hundred eleven in cash value, and then from there we're off to the races. Uh, this is the year over year cash value growth after year ten no more money going into the policy and it's you know 50,000 year over year growth up to uh, you know almost 90 at age 76 so uh, heavy growth scenario but if we're gonna leverage as many dollars as we can to reinvest in other places what does that look like we've got a uh, first a variable rate non-direct recognition model so there are uh, mutual companies that offer variable rates which is non-direct recognition uh, in most cases, uh, or this could also be a third party line of credit um, where that's not going to have any direct recognition treatment either. So, the first thing I want to point out is what if we take a 100% loan? Uh, where is basically where are we making money? So, at 6%, this is the difference between that growth scenario or sorry, the interest rates being paid on the loan. So this is an annual loan and cumulative loan. So basically taking every dollar out of the policy that we can, um, and then the interest due. So 6% on 100,000 is $6,000 of interest. Again, if we take another 100 in the next year, 200 out, uh, six six percent on two hundred is twelve thousand, and then our cumulative interest over here. So six grand in the first year, twelve grand in the second year is eighteen thousand. We're not we're paying the interest annually, but we're not paying back the loan. So uh, this is versus the cash value growth. So um, year over year here, uh, you know minus the amount we're putting in, here's the growth year over year. So basically, uh, what to make it easy, this is this is either going to be negative or it's going to be green. So is my policy earning more or less than the interest payments on my loan? And let's go back to the good times. 100% loan to value with certain, certain banks, which is Coastal State, and 3% at a variable rate. We're certainly uh, negative in the first couple of years until we start breaking even on the policy. This is just normal with the growth uh, scenario, no loans as well. And then after that, we're certainly arbitraging the heck out of the policy, uh, building wealth in two places at once. This is has nothing to do with what we're doing with the money, uh, but always recommend investing it into assets if you're going to take loans out. Um, this is just comparing interest uh, being accumulated and growing your cash value versus interest payments due on a policy on a uh, policy loan or a third party line of credit loan. So three percent, even three point two five percent, you know, all of it making quite a bit of money, and this is year over year uh, as well. So uh, really quite powerful. For example, cumulative cumulative loan four ninety seven versus. Uh, 1.620 uh, million, um, or sorry, cumulative interest versus um, versus a 1.62 uh, million cash value. So we put a million in, it's grown to 1.62, um, and this is the year-over-year -year, uh, difference or arbitrage. So, um, but what happens if uh, we're at race today. So let me jump over to another spreadsheet. These are some third parties that'll offer lines of credit um, based on how much cash value you have. So we're at the, let's just call it 250,000 to a million uh, rate. So Wall Street, they're gonna offer Wall Street Journal Prime minus 1%. So today that's actually what mine's at. It's about 5.25%. Um, so taking a 100% loan out of the policy, are we going to be making money? 
uh, or building wealth in two places at once. No, we're actually going to be kind of damaging uh, the wealth creation. So we're going to have to reduce the amount we're taking out at these extreme conditions that we're in right now. Uh, and this is also assuming forever, right? Which I was kind of talking about in the prior examples. History says this isn't going to go on forever, but it is uh, good to be aware of in the short term. Am I building or, or damaging my wealth creation? Um, so we'd have to go down and not arbitrage every single dollar out of the policy is kind of the takeaway here. So I plugged in 60% at 5.25 and, and uh, we're in the green here. So that's kind of uh, a simple summary of it. Um, and I, I'll, I'll go back, but basically I wanted to show what about policy loans. And the thing with policy loans, this is with a direct recognition company. So if I'm taking a policy loan, basically maxing that out and having direct recognition impact, the dividend, this is with Guardian, is 5.65%. So if I'm taking a loan, that interest rate is 4.76% fixed. Fixed rates usually have direct recognition impact. So uh, what that means is this dividend's gonna drop to 5%. So a 5% uh, dividend adds kind of a 0.65 impact to the loan rate. So it takes it, us up to the mid 5%. So what we've done here is essentially taken the max loan and seeing you know what's happening with these interest payments versus the cash value growth. And we do pay it back in years, uh, year 11. Um, so you can see the interest due over here if taking every dollar out of the policy is, is certainly higher than the cash value growth. Um, so in the, in the 10th year being 50,000 and the cash value growth being 25. But we pay it back. And remember, this is direct recognition. So we've been earning less dividends over the, the time on that loaned amount. So this net cash value is gonna be less than it, it were to be in the growth scenario or the uh, indirect recognition scenario. Um, but what happens is that the earning, earning growth goes right back to where it was. And this is kind of typical of maybe how people would use this. Let's take, you know, establish the policy so that we're setting that snowball in motion over time but I wanna take every dollar out and reinvest it in something that I can earn more money, say syndications, real estate syndications or something like that. But over time when I'm hitting my mid 60s, maybe I wanna slow down and just kinda of coast into uh, life and retirement and you pay it back and then that snowball is ready to hit the ground running for you so it's still growing uh, you know, 50,000 year over year, you have that death benefit, uh, and, and everything for uh, you know legacy planning. So this is 100% loan available, available. Right now, certainly not going to make money uh, or build wealth in two places at once, but you pay it back and that snowball is really rolling for you. So where, where exactly is it that um, the, the current uh, policy loan amount would actually not impact the growth? And this is a policy loan of 50,000 every single year. You're putting in 100 for 10 years. This policy loan is going for you know, 20 years. Um, and really, right in that years, uh, year six, that interest due is only 11,000 and your year over year growth is hitting 12 and then it starts to take off from there. So you're, you're certainly safe at this amount and it doesn't stop, right? You're actually going for quite some time. Um, taking out uh, quite a bit of money to invest. Uh, at that $75,000 uh, time frame, you're, you're right about uh, hitting, hitting the, uh, the tipping point there where it still may make sense, but uh, recommendation would be to pay that back and, and let that, that ball roll without uh, re-leveraging every dollar. So what do we do right now? Again, summary, dividends have traditionally followed bond yields, which bond yields are increasing. So it's likely we'll see an uptick in dividends over the next few years. The Fed fund rate, funds rate, although increasing dramatically right now, in MMT economies also trends towards zero. So it's likely we're gonna see that come back down over the next few years. After something breaks, the Fed will hit the brakes 
uh, and interest rates will likely drop back to zero, meaning third party locks, those rates should be around three, three and a quarter percent. But what do we do right now until that to bridge over the next couple of years? We can lower the LTV, meaning not uh, take every dollar out of the policy on policy loan or a line of credit. Um, and that's one option. Uh, we can wait or just anticipate that lower interest rates, higher dividends are likely to occur, but it's going to take a few years and just be okay with that. Or you can take, and this is what I'm doing, basically drain and use the policy. So take a max loan and invest it. But then over time, because we're having cash flow or, or earnings, you know, from our W-2 or whatever coming into our pocket, put that money and build back up your cash value or your line of credit dry powder over time. This effectively lowers the LTV like number one, but you don't have to wait. Uh, you just are naturally building that back up for next investment or waiting for the right investment, which is very common right now. And I actually reflecting on this was doing this inadvertently. So, you know, I invested quite a, quite a bit earlier in the year. Then deals have been kind of few and far between. So I was slowly building up my dry powder in my policy, effectively lowering my LTV, waiting for the right opportunity. I just found something. So I deployed basically all of my money into that. And then I'm going to start the process of building it back up again. So this seems like the most practical um, and effective strategy that I'm going to be using, which effectively lowers the LTV and makes it so that we are earning or building wealth in two places at once, but not, not waiting. We're still deploying money to the right opportunities. So these would kind of be the steps, same, same information, just uh, summarized. Take a max loan for investing, then Use your cash flow, use your W-2, whatever, to build back your cash value with cash flow over time. This effectively lowers your LTV, making sure that those interest, so you're paying back your principal. This effectively lowers your uh, LTV and your interest rate using your policy as your bank, banking on yourself. Uh, it's more practical, practical because there's normally a buildup period and waiting period, especially right now. Deals are hard to find, you know, the Fed is and the government is trying to slow things down and they're being effective at that, right? You can see that in deal flow and other things, um, you know, people staying out of the stock market, whatever, they're holding on to their money. You can do this except for instead of in your checking account, you, you can do it in your policy um, and wait for the right deal and uh, make sure that you're not being too loose with capital allocation because equally as important as building up this these policies is also making sure you're deploying funds into the correct investments that are going to make you uh, more substantial wealth over time so you know uh, buying tech stocks right now may be a, a poor or risky choice for a capital allocation um, but uh, a real estate deal that has uh, prudent leverage, fixed rate, you know, seller finance that, you know, is going to cash flow and make you money over time with some value add, you know, that may be a safer or more prudent allocation of capital. Uh, so taking those two into account is, is important. Okay, I hope this was helpful. It was a little bit, uh, you know, talking about many different topics and diving into numbers and back out to a summary. So let me know if you have any questions and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. Also, you can learn more at alphacrusaders.com at the link at the end of this video.